Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. You know, I get to uh, bring you interesting conversations with uh, fascinating people every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock. And tonight, I think it's going to be interesting because I'm going to be joined by the co-founders of the Academy for Business Communications, Elizabeth Williams and Andrew Brown. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to find out uh, what uh, the Academy for Business Communications is all about. And I think they've got an argument that uh, you should listen to in regards to communications during this pandemic and, more importantly, next year. Elizabeth, how are you? Welcome to our show. I'm great, Brian. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. And Andrew, you too. Welcome to our show. Thank you, Brian. So tell us, what is the Academy for Business Communications? And uh, Elizabeth, you said that what you think is companies should uh, not be disinvesting in communications. They should be investing in communications in 2021. Tell us why. Well, so the Academy of Business Communications is a uh, consulting and training company that works with um, business organizations to help them do a better job of communicating with employees and other stakeholders who matter. And this year during COVID, of course, those conversations matter probably more than at any time in the past as we've sent workers home or we've had to bring workers into uh, difficult and complicated situations. And so what we're seeing is a, a little bit of a trend that concerns us because as we're coming into 2021, of course, businesses are hurting and revenue is down and they're looking to take costs out next year. And one of the places that it's always tempting to cut is the employee communications budget, right? It feels a bit fluffy. It doesn't have a direct impact on revenue. So yeah, it's just let's just cut that stuff out. And we argue that that is actually... Um, the opposite of what you should be doing, because you really, really need to be having great conversations with your employees if you're going to get through this pandemic and and beyond and into a robust recovery. Why? Andrew? Well, uh, well, the reason why uh, people want uh, robust communications in order to get through the this troubled time is because communications are uh, or rather communications is the means by which uh, organizations can come together uh, with different skills and can actually allocate time and energy and they are limited towards a common goal. So if you eliminate some of the processes, the peoples, the tools used to help strengthen that bond that needs to be there between an employer and employees, you are going to jeopardize the longevity of the company. But some companies, you know, I think probably don't know what they're going to say. They've, they, they've furloughed people, they've laid off people, they've reduced wages for people, they don't know when they're coming back, and then all of a sudden the provincial government comes out with a new edict that we've got to all closed down. So how do you communicate when you don't know exactly what you're saying? So uh, part of that is messaging, but let's keep in mind that uh, communication goes both ways. So a big part of communications that needs to that that needs to happen in all organizations is also listening. So let's also recognize that in order to communicate well, that these companies have to make sure that they listen to what the employees need in terms of what their safety requirements are, what their expecta expectations of are of leaders, uh, how they expect to work uh, safely within the organization. So let's also make sure that we acknowledge that. So uh, your, your point of there's a great deal of un uncertainty, sure, but only part of that is really concerned about the messages with which to share with employees. Okay, so so I understand what you're saying. Um, you've got to listen, and people need to feel like they're being listened to. But I come back to, you know, what do you say if you don't know exactly what you're saying? Well, I think the, the first thing you need to do is, is that listening will often tell you the kind of messages that employees aren't hearing and that they need to hear. And it can be as, as just everyday stuff as here's how to stay safe. Here's what our expectations are in terms of masks and distancing and things. And then it, it can go out from there into, you know, here's what we think is going to happen. Here's our vision for the future. Um, it can be thanking people. I think that that's one of the things that we don't do enough of on a good day in organizations. So a lot of what we should be saying is just saying, you know, thank you for coming out. Thank you for, for working together. Thank you for helping our customers or our clients or our suppliers or whoever get through this. And, and I don't think that you can recognize people enough in a time like this. So if you don't have anything nice to say, just say thank you. I, I would leave it there. 
We're chatting tonight with uh, Elizabeth Williams and Andrew Brown, the two co-founders of the Academy for Business Communications. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with uh, Andrew and Elizabeth in just a minute. Stay with us. Well, welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour, Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Elizabeth William and Andrew Brown, who are the co-founders of the Academy for Business Communications. Um, maybe, Elizabeth, I, I could just start with you. The Academy for Business Communications, this is what, a consulting company? Uh, we do consulting and training. And Andrew and I have both worked in the employee communications business here in Canada for, well, um, a long time, over 20 years each. <laughs> so between us, we're practically half a century. And, uh, and the thing we've noticed in recent years is that um, employers and executives in particular and frontline managers are really struggling to communicate effectively with employees. And then COVID comes along and makes it even harder. And, um, and so we created a company that works with these communicators so they can be corporate communications people, HR people, private project managers, and of course, the executives themselves to help them build those skills that they need, because no one's teaching them this stuff anymore. They certainly don't teach it at MBA school. And uh, as we offer training, and then we also offer consulting um, to help leaders with specific problems, for example, mergers, acquisitions, pandemics. Um, and so, so that's really our, our focus. And we work with companies all over Canada. Andrew, why is communications during COVID-19 so challenging? And, and why do you think it's so critically important for companies to maintain those communications? Well, let's, let's talk about the reality of communications in COVID times. Uh, first and format, foremost, uh, mortality is uh, front and center more than it's ever been before. People are concerned about their own safety and coming to work. Are they going to get themselves sick or those of their colleagues and loved ones? That's never been at such a prominent ball in play as far as employee communications have been before. Um, there's so a sa huge safety and health is number one. Yes, ex exactly. Um, uncertainty is off the charts. We don't know when this is going to begin or rather when this is going to end or when things are going to get better. Yes, there are promises of vaccines, uh, new processes, uh, being rolled out and all those are great but the reality is we don't know when thing this is going to really end and that in itself when when people don't have an end in sight uh humans tend to make worst case scenarios there have been a lot of prominent studies that show that uh we uh anticipate grief. And so we actually make things worse for one another, or for ourselves rather, and as a result, for one another. You take that kind of stew uh, in an organization, and you're trying to communicate, recognizing that people's mindsets, their mental health, their ability to process information, the speed with which they can actually take information in and then retain it, all of those are really negatively affected by the fears and the fact that there's no end in sight. Okay, so people are, uh, are worried, uh, health and safety, mortality, unquestionably an issue, but they're also worried about their jobs. They're worried about, uh, about their money, a paycheck. How do you, if you don't know when you're gonna be able to bring people back, how do you communicate? Well, that's where you focus on building trust, right? And so at the end of the day, what communications does is build trust. And so, um, yeah, it, it, when all you've got is uncertainty to work with, then you need to, you need to build that trust and you need to build that engagement. And one of the things that we are encouraging leaders to do right now, because you don't know, is start building that shared sense of purpose, right? I mean, I mean, we all, and maybe that purpose is just survival. Maybe that purpose is helping save lives. Maybe that purpose is just keeping more people fed. Um, but if you can rally people around purpose, if you can build trust in that purpose, and, um, and then if you, can, if you can give people stories to tell about what that looks like, then, then you can really try, you can, you can keep your people together and you can keep them focused together on looking forward instead of on the existential threat that, that overhangs us. And so I would say that the best thing you can do as a, as a leader right now is start looking for those COVID stories. How did you help people? How did you help each other? How is your organization coming together to get through this? And capture those stories. And they might be mundane little stories or they might be very touching big stories. But if you're capturing those stories and you're telling them, well, now you're putting information into a form that we're used to hearing it, right? So you can only put so many posters on the wall about washing your hands. You can only have so many town halls before people just wanna put 
throw the computer through the window. But if you're telling stories, then you're dimensionalizing uh, your purpose and you're building that trust. And now you've got something you can take into the future. So when all of this is over, you're going to be boring the heck out of employees in 20 years with, I remember during the pandemic, we did this great thing. And that's fantastic because a good culture is the one that tells stories. A good culture is one that tells stories. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So, you know, I think that there's um, sort of, uh, you know, a couple of different uh, types of companies in this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic time period. Some are doing spectacular, Amazon and, uh, and you know, other people that are, are, are e-commerce related and delivering their, or whatever it is, straight to home. Um, others are battening down the hatches and uh, revenue's gone to zero and uh, are just waiting for this whole thing to end. And then others are sort of in the middle and, you know, think about the restaurant or the retail store or the, or the whatnot that's, uh, you know, open, close, open, close, uh, reduce staff, et cetera. Um, how do you create these stories if you don't have the stories? Well, I think there are stories that are happening at various times and various levels within the organization. And that might happen at the leadership and the ownership level or uh, really on the frontline manager, the, you know, the, uh, the restaurant, uh, you know, the wait waiter, waitresses, they've got uh, stories and they may not always be great stories or rather positive stories. But again, the, to what Elizabeth was, was saying, um, uh, story or rather cultures require stories. Organizations that have great cultures are built on stories. And sometimes those are stories that are not happy stories because stories come with them a lesson as a set of values, something that is reinforced that helps people understand what it's like to work at the organization, why it's important to be at the organization, the value that it brings. So there are stories that challenge can be, all right, how do we capture them? Uh, how should we tell them? Which ones should live? I mean, uh, six months from now, a year from now, some people are going to want to want to forget COVID altogether, right? Oh, man, what a headache that was. That was brutal. We lost revenue. We lost great people. And there's going to be a tendency to want to do that. But we have to actually fight that urge because how we deal with tragedies and massive change like COVID helps really reinforce what's important to an organization. So those stories are even more important. I, I actually have a good example of a story. Um, it's okay, a small great. business and um, yeah, and the very uncertain future for this business because their revenue is just, um, is, is really in peril. And so what the CEO did was he actually told a story about how he's been really struggling with his own anxiety and mental health since they've all had to lock down. And this is one of those 80 hour a week people who just kind of ran his business. And so he told his, his staff, he said, I don't know what's going to happen. And to be honest with you, I've been really struggling here at home. I'm ready to kill my kids. I'm very afraid of the future and I don't know what it's bringing, but my goodness, I'm just happy that I've got the best people in the business around me. And that it's like a, it's like a 30 second story. And it just made a world of difference because he was vulnerable he was human, he was authentic, all those things we keep telling leaders you gotta be. Well, that's what that looks like, folks. And, and I hope that organization is gonna keep telling that story about how this CEO came out and admitted to something that everybody was struggling with and made himself vulnerable. And um, you know, I think that organization will emerge much stronger after all of this is done. Yeah, they're gonna have to claw their revenue back for the next few years and yeah, they're sure gonna be watching expenses. But um, my goodness, don't you wanna work for that person? You know what, Elizabeth, um, I'd like to work for that person, but I don't know if those are many people like that in leadership positions. You know, you, you take a look at our elected uh, personnel who we've seen way too much uh, over the course of the last uh, couple of months as they've been announcing. And I don't think many of them I would describe as vulnerable, human and authentic. Um, so, you know, do we have leaders that are vulnerable, human and authentic? And, and, and is that, are those traits that we really are, are somehow teaching our business leaders, our political leaders. Um, you know, Donald so, Trump yeah. <laughs> certainly doesn't uh, look well, like any of those words. Well, uh, I think that we have to separate the fact that sometimes the leaders that we see in certain uh, spheres like politics may uh, be on one end of the 
on one end of the spectrum. But if we're talking about organizational organizational leaders, uh, uh, we found that uh, companies from across industries, uh, the leaders there are very much uh, committed to trying to help uh, the organizations thrive. Uh, they are bent on being uh, continuous learners. So there is a real commitment. Now, that doesn't mean that they have the dexterity to do it or that they uh, are naturally uh, imbued with those qualities from birth. There, are, It's hard work to get people to become strong, uh, compassionate, uh, skilled communicators. And leader, there are yeah, across industries, a number of people who fit that uh, those criteria. So I'd say yes. Uh, let's not focus on the outliers. Uh, our focus is always to uh, help people wherever they are get have them get better uh, than get better to where they want to be. So that's that's what happens with uh, training and consulting. We have to come in wherever their baseline is. We're going to help them get better. So, so, so you're telling me, Elizabeth and Andrew, that uh, if we hired you to come into the company, you would tell the leader that he needs to be or she needs to be more vulnerable, more authentic, more mm -hmm. human, more compassionate. Not, you need to be strong. You need to know where you're going. You need to be committed. Well, I think you need to put all of those things into into balance. I mean, uh, nobody wants to work for you know, a, a, a robot, uh, we work for human beings. And, and in fact, we leave human beings. When people leave companies, they don't leave the desk or the copy or the coffee, they leave their boss. And so I think that what we're hearing and leaders get this. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Yeah. Say that again, please. People don't leave companies. They leave bosses. People don't leave companies, they leave bosses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's it's, really interesting. Yeah. And, and if you think about all the, the companies that you walked away from, it was almost always, if not your boss, it was your boss's boss. And, and, and managers know this. And the truth is, in many, many industries, there's still a lot of competition for top talent. And as, as much as unemployment is at, at a, a huge um, uh, spike right now, there's still a lot of competition for skilled people. And, and employers know that. And leaders are telling us, you know, how do I keep these good people through this? Because my goodness, as soon as we can get to push the go button again, we're going to need all hands on deck and we're going to need the best talent. And they get this. I, I'm not hearing a lot of leaders telling me anymore that, you know, I just need to be a strong guy. They're telling me, how do I do this authenticity thing mm -hmm. without looking like an idiot or feeling, you know, scared or, or you know, vulnerable is a for many people, a bad word, right? Vulnerable means I'm, I, I could lose something. But, but in fact, vulnerable really just means there's no walls around me. And so we, we try to get them to focus on that piece of vulnerability and less on the, you're going to get mugged in an alley. And, um, and, and we, quite honestly, just telling a story makes you human. And, and a lot of leaders, um, I think, have been done a great disservice over the years by being told to swim with sharks and lean in mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And, and it stripped them of, of the thing that they bring to work every single day, whether they want to or not, which is the fact that they're human. And so a lot of our work is just reconnecting these people with being human, strip out some of the jargon, strip out some of the BS, and just talk to people you know, like they're the human beings that, that they are. And, and you know, all that DNA that we share actually makes it pretty easy to have these conversations if we can get out of our own way. When you walk in to consult uh, with uh, some companies and some leaders, are they typically open to your suggestions about being vulnerable, being authentic, being human? Or do they well, react the way I did that said, no, what they need to do is be strong, courageous, I steadfast, think, committed? I, I think it really depends on the sophistication of the leaders. I found that those that uh, have had uh, responsibility for governance or large organizations, they seem to get it faster or they have a greater appreciation for the need to be compassionate because they have uh, managed across different functions. And they realize that within an organization, you'll have a number of different stakeholders. But what runs common uh, across all those stakeholders will be a uh, an emphasis on compassion and humanness and, and integrity and authenticity and, and even transparency. So uh, it's, I, I think it's more about the experience and their sophistication. And I find that uh, leaders eventually get to that. 
Well, and Brian, I would argue too that they're not mutually exclusive. You can be strong and human and you can be forceful and vulnerable and you can have a great big compelling vision that, that keeps you up at night and still be a nice person. So I think it's finding that balance and it's communicating that underneath all the strength and all the drive, there's still just a, a regular person who's trying to get things done and trying to keep their company going. So one of the big uh, comments that uh, I remember from the last two weeks in regards to this U.S. election was the people were saying that uh, Donald Trump uh, wasn't vulnerable. Well, wasn't I, I empathetic, guess. wasn't compassionate. Mm -hmm. But yet 47% of the people in the United States voted for him. Well, and again, I would, I would, I think Andrew put it very well earlier is, you know, politicians play a role, right? So, so the way that politicians communicate and the way they come, I don't know that he's not vulnerable when he's, you know, with his inner circle in the Oval Office. I'm not even going to speculate about that one. Um, I think the politicians aren't necessarily um, enacting the things that we would want to see in an organizational leader. Some why? Are. Why? Why not? Why? Why is why is politics so different than business? Why does everything that you talk about in regards to vulnerability, humanness, authentic, integrity, transparency, shared sense of values count for business people, if not for politicians. You mean, uh, so uh, I, I would argue that uh, it should in an ideal world. However, uh, the reality is that right now it's not. And we're not here to create an alternate universe. We work with organizations because they've come to realize that these things are important to help them thrive, to connect with their audiences. It's quite possible that politicians will come to that realization and say, it's more important to have those qualities than what they portray right now. But again, we work with organizations to help them move needles that are important to them. We're chatting tonight with Elizabeth Williams and Andrew Brown, the co-founders of the Academy for Business Communications. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Elizabeth and Andrew in just a minute. Stay with us. Well, we're having an interesting conversation on the Brian Crombie Radio Hour uh, tonight with Elizabeth Williams and Andrew Brown, the co-founders of the Academy of Business Communications. Um, I said before it was for business communications, and it's not. It's of business communications, the Academy uh, of uh, business communications. Um, and I'm trying to give them a hard time to try to challenge them. Uh, I actually agree with uh, their argument, but, uh, but it's interesting because, you know, I think that uh, a lot of people during tough times think that uh, they, uh, you know, to be a good leader, you got to be strong. You got to be, uh, you got to be powerful. You got to know where you're going. And it's sort of the general patent kind of, uh, of uh, image um, of leadership, but actually the more successful um leader, I think, was uh, FDR, who was clearly vulnerable. He was a, he was a, he was a cripple. Um, and, uh, and he had the fireside chats on a fairly regular basis. And he was empathetic. Um, and he appealed to people's better nature um, mm -hmm. and uh, really got them to, uh, to, uh, to, to join in in, in the effort. Um, in, uh, in the last uh, couple of months, I got to tell you, the politician, and I keep coming back to that, I apologize, uh, uh, that's uh, a frame of reference I have, but the politician that I've enjoyed watching the most is Governor Andrew Cuomo in New York State. And I'm not sure if you've seen any of his mm -hmm. press conferences, but, uh, but he is extremely knowledgeable and, and, and has his beliefs of the right thing to do in regards to uh, the, the, the public health measures that they've taken. Uh, he's factual-based, he communicates like crazy, in regards to the numbers and the statistics and, and what's happening. But then Elizabeth, he ends every press conference with a story. And it's often a personal story. And it's a story that has relevance and connectivity to whatever the, the theme of the day was. Um, but it really makes the, uh, the facts and figures and the message that he talked about real. And I think that really is a skill. And uh, I'm not sure how he does it. Uh, but he he turns and he you know he speaks straight to the cameras and he tells the story and it's often as I said personal, um, and it is often what people remember the most after the fact uh, more than the than the than the stories uh, than the, than the facts and figures themselves. 
But well, and I think the, the reason that that works, Brian, is because he's tapping into, again, a fundamentally human thing. We've been telling stories for 100,000 years, long before we were drawing on cave walls or even uh, writing, which we've only been doing for 3,500. So in many ways, we're, we're hardwired to learn through stories. So somebody is giving him very good advice, or he's got a really strong instinct for that, because what he's doing is he's communicating in the one way that we, from birth, are, are used to learning. And, um, and, and the other thing he's tapping into is, you know, when we hear stories, we, we get flooded with neurochemicals. So stories about empathy um, give us that oxytocin, you know, that's that, that feel good um, um, sense of belonging and stories that, that have sort of humor, they give us those endorphins. So we feel good and positive and focused. And so a good storyteller actually knows how to tell the right story to elicit the right neurochemical response. So I would say that Andrew uh, Andrew Cuomo is is kind of a, um, a a fantastic role model for any leader who wants to master storytelling because he does it quickly, he makes it personal, and he makes it memorable and and to the point where you remember it. Andrew, can you over communicate? Oh, can you over communicate? Uh, ask anyone who's received uh, emails in the last few days, uh, rather few months. I mean, based, because of COVID. Uh, employees uh, across different industries receive a, an abundance of communication and, and understand that it's often coming out of a really good place, good intentions, and that might be, hey, we want you to know that you're important to us, or we've got brand new rules that, uh, that, need, that everyone needs to comply with in order for them to maintain safety uh, and, and well-being of themselves and their colleagues. But the fundamental thing about communication is really knowing you know, the right message, the right time at the right place. And usually when there's over-communication, it's because people have forgotten some of those fundamentals of really good communication. So it is a, an unfortunate outcome that can sometimes uh, just overwhelm people but usually there's good intentions. Elizabeth, I know that you've had a lot of thoughts on over-communicating. Well, yeah, because I think it's this sort of instinct. And in fact, I would argue that an awful lot of, I mean, we're hearing a lot about, you know, pandemic fatigue and, and all of that. And, and we have people pointing fingers saying, he told me to wear a mask, then he told me not to wear a mask. And then he told me I should wear a mask, but not that mask. And, and that in many ways is, is symptomatic of people who there's just too much information coming at them. And, and we have this tendency when we have important things to say, to turn our little trickle of information into a fire hose. And you know, we know how, how well that works when you're trying to get somebody to listen. And, and so I think that over communication can cause fatigue. It can cause us not to listen. Um, it can certainly cause confusion. It certainly it's, it's a lot more work than it needs to be. And, it, it, and when you over communicate, you put the onus on the listener to figure out what's important here. And I think that that's certainly what I hear when I hear about people being confused about mixed messages, about you know pandemic fatigue, whether it's in organizations or just in the public, because there's so much information and we're just done with trying to sort through and figure out what matters here. And I'll bring that back to the role of leaders. That is your job as a leader. Your job as a leader is to make sense of the world for the people in your organization. To say, look at this, not that. Pay attention to this not that. And, and organizations that just kind of barf information all over their employees, or even quite honestly, their customers or their suppliers are, are not being helpful in that. And, and it's disappointing because Andrew and I were, were talking earlier about all these articles that came out saying, in a, in a crisis, over communicate. We saw that in Forbes. We saw that in the Wall Street Journal. It was like, no, no, don't over communicate. It's like over drinking. It seems like a good idea while you're doing it, but it just doesn't end well. And Brian, uh, reference back to Andrew Cuomo, right? You, uh, you uh, identified him as a as a good archetype of uh, storyteller and, and leader and communicator. And I, I think you're right. And yes, he tells good stories. He doesn't over communicate. He chunks information. And one of the things that he also does is he is completely, uh, or rather, he gives the impression that he. Uh, is authentic. He will actually come out and say, and say, I don't know. And that, to what we were saying earlier before, uh, was uh, maintaining humanness. Uh, during tough times, it's quite conceivable that 
he doesn't know. And it's all right to tell folks, employees, that you don't have the answer to everything. You wouldn't want to be going back and doing it over and over again, because then it makes you look uninformed. But he uh, provides a sphere around which he is an area, he has expertise, and there's some questions that he doesn't know, but they're going to find out what those answers are. So he's not afraid to be very human in telling the stories and again, chunking things so that it doesn't feel like he's over communicating. On his daily press conferences, mm -hmm. he has PowerPoint slides all the time. Are mm -hmm. those visuals helpful? You know, he's one of the only politicians that's presenting every day, as we've seen a whole bunch of different politicians, both in Canada and the United States um, and in different provinces and states communicate. He's one of the only ones that uses slides on a, on a fairly regular basis and, and numerous of them rather than just one or two. Is that good or bad? I would say that anytime you can add other ways of understanding to what you're communicating, it's good. And so visuals are particularly good. We know, um, you know, when you've got people who maybe don't speak English quite as well, you've got people of, you know, various disabilities um, and people learn differently, right? Some people mm -hmm. are visual learners. Some people are audible learners. Some people uh, need a little bit of both. And so, yeah, so I, I applaud anyone who looks for multiple ways to present the information so that it's, it's more accessible to people for sure. And it's probably easier for him as well to communicate that way. It's, so it's a, a little, it could be a little bit of a crutch, but as Elizabeth say, says, if it helps to convey the idea to a, another set of listeners and they get it more because they are both a combination of visual learners as well as auditory le uh, learners, that's amazing. You know, compared to some of the other leaders that we've seen, he's not using a teleprompter. And so others uh, that uh, we've seen um, won't have the PowerPoint slides, but will be just reading it from a teleprompter. And for some reason, uh, to me at least, uh, even though he is probably, as Elizabeth said, using it as a little bit of a crutch so he knows what he's uh, saying, it, it appears more authentic that he actually knows what he's talking about because he's not reading what some speechwriter wrote for him. He's actually talking the stuff. Well, I think the key there is that he's not reading. I, I mean, that's one of the things that, that you and I watch, these poor medical officers of health who, who never signed up to be on a daily um, um, presser. And there they are, you know, reading their little teleprompter or reading their notes. And, um, and I think one of the things that Andrew Cuomo, like, like so many other politicians, is he's, he's good on his feet and he doesn't, he, he's actually, again, more authentic when you're talking like a person than if you're just trying to get through your lines. And, and, um, and yeah, so Andrew's right. Those, those PowerPoints are probably his, you know, his cheat notes. Um, but boy, it sounds a lot more human when, when someone's doing that stumbles and ums and ahs and all. So when you're um, bringing in a, a leader and you're training them, how do you, how do you get them ready to make speeches, to make presentations, to communicate? What do you do with them? Well, there, there are a few things. Uh, one, it's really important to understand uh, their voice. So it's their message, but for something to sound authentic, it's got to sound natural coming out of their, their mouth. So it's understanding their rhythms, their lexicon, understanding uh, what is important to them. So that's a part of it. Understanding the uh, organizational context. If a leader goes out and says, we're going to be amazing this quarter and yet people know that's not the case, then that's going to uh, torpedo any efforts to try to be authentic. So we have to understand that context. Uh, we also have to understand the audience because uh, it's, it's often too easy to fall into the trap that uh, uh, of, hey, if we're going to be training leaders how to communicate, that we forget that we actually have to be aware of our audience and what's important to them and how do they listen? How do they take information? I worked with a very talented uh, leader, a, a, uh, a genuine storyteller, and we would go around uh, in the organization and we would try uh, parts of the story out just to see how people's eyes would react when we were trying certain things. And so he could see how people were responding to his messages, his slight and reflections and it just made him a better storyteller and of course he was able to test the messages so that he we could refine 
the, the scripts, the speeches, uh, the overall themes. And so that by the time he got in front of an audience, we already knew it was going to be magnificent. Yeah, I always know we're succeeding when I have a leader complaining to me that I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. And in, especially in larger organizations, you know, that to me sounds a bit like success. If you're already a bit bored with your message, it means that you are getting it out there. Because I think that's one of the other things that we, we coach them on is, you know, you do have to say the same thing over and over again, right? It's like your kids, you can tell them the same thing a hundred times, but it's the hundred and first time before it finally penetrates. And, and, you know, so they think because they said it once, everyone in the organization gets that this is our strategy or that this is where I want you to focus or this is one of our values. And, and so we sort of say, pick three things that you really, really, really need people to know this year and just hammer those suckers home and find different ways of saying them. And, um, you know, just because you know everything, you've got this, you know, giant amount of information in your head doesn't mean everybody else needs to have all of that all at once. And so that's one of the things, again, that we teach is, you know, pick a couple things to say really, really well, rather than a lot of things to say badly. So it's like having a stump, spe stump speech that you repeat over and over again. Yeah, yeah. And right. they should, at the end of the year, feel like someone's pulling a string in their back and they're just talking. And, um, and, and that's good. And the larger the organization, you know what, sadly, that's your role. The more you've so got to go out there and say it over and over. I've worked with some politicians and some leaders that uh, sort of have an ego thing. Oh, you know, I'm a great speaker. I can get up and, uh, and, and do it right. You know, first, <laughs> fantastically, the very first time. Mm -hmm. um, so you recommend people obviously practice? Oh, uh, practice is, uh, is what makes great storytellers, great speakers. And it really serves them well as well, a leader who goes out who's unprepared, who might think that they're amazing, uh, will miss out on the nuances, uh, won't be able to observe people and how they react because they'll be so focused on what they're saying. Or they might inadvertently say something uh, in, in an audience uh, that is just completely tone deaf. And at a time when you're building trust with an audience uh, and during uh, stressful times, you're always uh, enhancing trust uh, to a degree. So you really want to make sure that you choose your words carefully and your inflections uh, very carefully. So yes. Perhaps. So I've got a great story on that if I could. Mm, uh, so I used to work for the Jim Pattison group and we had a management meeting uh, in Kelowna, BC. And uh, Jimmy really wanted to have Bob Hope, who was his famous uh, favorite comedian, come and present it. And he tried and he tried. And after you know a couple of years of trying, he finally got Bob Hope to agree to come. And he came like three days after he was in front of Madison Square Gardens, 20,000 people, uh, came to Kelowna, BC to 200 people with the Patterson Group. And uh, on the Saturday afternoon before the Saturday evening that Bob Hope was going to be uh, um, speaking to us, uh, Jimmy and I were walking through the, the ballroom and uh, we saw Bob Hope up on stage, practicing his entrance, practicing his exit, practicing his jokes, practicing everything that he was doing. And Jimmy went up to him and said, you know, you didn't even know who I was. You didn't even know where Kelowna, BC was. You didn't want to come here and speak to 200 people that work for the Patterson organization. Two days ago, you were speaking for 20,000 people in Madison Square Gardens. What are you doing? And he said, Bob Hope, whether he's in front of 20,000 people in Madison Square Gardens or 200 people in Penticton or Kelowna, BC, is going to be the best Bob Hope Bob Hope could ever be. That's why I'm practicing. And that is the power of a story because that's one that you've probably, you've obviously told it more than once. And um, never, and, and, never, I've never said it before. I mean, you just pulled that out of nowhere. Yeah. And that's a great story. I mean, I'm going to tell that story. And so, yeah. And then, and that's, that's actually it. And I think one of the small benefits of, of all of us now living on zoom is there's actually video evidence of how well speakers um, and leaders do. And, and in fact, that's one of the things even pre pandemic that we always recommended was, you know, football players use game tapes to get better at the next game. And so we always say, you know, every town hall, every speech, every shareholder meeting is a game. Record it and let's sit down and let's go through and see, you know, was your body language good? Was your tone good? Were you, was your rhythm good? Did you tell a stupid joke that you just can't admit is stupid? Um, how was your entrance? How was your accent? None of that is accidental. And, um, and I think that, you know, Steve Jobs, right? Um, was, was probably natively one of the worst speakers on the planet. And that's why he planned every one of those product launches at their theatrical best, literally down to every single step he took across the, the stage because it mattered to him that much.
We're chatting tonight with Elizabeth Williams and Andrew Brown, the co-founders of the Academy of Business Communications. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us. Well, welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour, Saga 960. Fascinating conversation tonight with Elizabeth Williams and Andrew Brown of the um, Academy of Business Communications about communications. And we've talked about a bunch of different concepts. Uh, stories is one of the concepts we've talked about. Uh, practice is one of the concepts we've talked about. Uh, Elizabeth, you mentioned uh, that you have to have three things. Um, Joe Biden in the debate stage, uh, people were having drinking game. How often he said, well, there's, you know, three points they want to make. Do you, do you think you've always got to have three things or five things? Is there, is there uh, benefits to having a structure around how many things you're going to, uh, say? I don't think there's a magic number, if that's what you're asking. Um, I find that three is easy enough for people to remember, both the person saying it and the, the people receiving it. Um, once you're up above five, they're going to start to go, oh, was that other thing we were going to talk about? So yeah, three, it can be four, it can be two. Um, you know, it, 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 the number doesn't matter. It's really just, um, again, it's how do we package the information in a way that people understand it, internalize it, remember it. And at the end of the day, as communicators, what we're changing is behavior, right? So what is it that we want people to do? And what do they need to believe to be true in order to do that? And what facts do we need to give them in order for them to believe that to be true? So that's really the, the kind of work back that we do with leaders is, is what do you want people to do? Because, you know, organizations are, are not about necessarily what we think, it's about what we do. So, um, yeah, so, so I don't think there's a magic number. But three is, three is the one I generally aim for with most leaders. You know, I think that that uh, is a great suggestion. Not often enough that people answer the question, what do I want people to do? Um, you know, they, they've got the opportunity to make a speech because someone invited them to, to make a speech, but, but they don't know what the call to action, what the, uh, the outcome is. For a politician, it's easy. It's I want them to vote for me. But for a lot of other people, you know, do I want them to buy my product, buy my stock? Um, stay with the company and not quit, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. but they, you've got to have, the, what's the objective? Otherwise, why the heck are you wasting time talking? Mm -hmm. Andrew, if there is uh, one thing you wanted uh, business leaders to be thinking about doing in the communications for, uh, you know, this pandemic or, or as 2021 comes upon us, what would that one thing be? I think it would be to hone their listening skills. Uh, we talked earlier about uh, core messages and, and practicing and the importance of, of stories. And a lot of the success of that uh, resides on the ability to collect the information and quickly process it and develop messaging. But you can't develop good messaging if you don't listen to your audience. So uh, set up infrastructures, regardless of how big your team is, whether are you're a small business with 10, 15 people, or you know, you're rapidly expanding, you've got several hundred, you've got to institutionalize listening. And that means throughout the organization. Sometimes that's through surveys. Sometimes that's just through structured observation. Uh, sometimes it's at, at group meetings that, uh, that are very lively. It, it is incumbent upon leaders and senior management to actively listen, organize their, their lessons from listening, and then take those lessons and turn them into relevant message or how they bring the messages to bear. Andrew, I'll tell you another story. So I was in a church doing a sermon and I mm. quoted Jimmy Patterson again. And I said, uh, as I was talking about uh, leadership and speaking, uh, that Jimmy Patterson always used to tell me that uh, God gave us uh, um, two ears and one mouth so that we listen twice as often as uh, we talk. And this, uh, at the end of the sermon, this uh, lady came up to me and said, you got it all wrong. You got it all wrong. <laughs> God designed us with a mouth that can open and close and ears that are always open because we should always be listening and only once in a while talk. Uh, I, I like that. And again, what a, what a great story and, and, a, and, a, and a very good uh, moral. Uh, it's, it's really too easy. And again, you know, we deal with managers and senior management and leaders who are passionate about their business. They want to see them succeed and they want to bring their employees along with them for the ride. They see them as a vital part for growth. And yet um, the way to do that um, is yes, 
have in inspiration and great processes in place so that people can do their jobs well. But a big part of that is actually spending the time and being seen to lis be listening as well. People want to be heard. People want yeah. you to listen to them. Perfectly said. We're chatting tonight with Elizabeth Williams and Andrew Brown, co-founders of the Academy of Business Communications. If people want to contact you for some of your consulting services, do you have a website they can go to? They absolutely do. It's um, academyofbusinesscommunications.com. And um, you can also find uh, both of us on LinkedIn. And we would uh, love to hear from you there as well. Or you can send an email to info at academyofbusinesscommunications.com. Well, Elizabeth Williams and Andrew Brown, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. We're going to uh, take a final break, and I'm going to come back with some of my own concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us. Well, thank you very much to Elizabeth Williams and Andrew Brown of the uh, Academy of Business Communications for telling us a little bit about uh, communications, particularly during the time of COVID-19. I really appreciated some of their suggestions. Um, you know, I think the idea of stories and, uh, and all of us exchanged a few stories. Uh, you know, it's Paul Beluga, who is the uh, uh, key campaign manager for Clinton, that I think said that one of the mistakes that a lot of politicians make is they, they are stuck in policies and stuck in numbers, and they never talk about the narrative. And uh, I think Elizabeth was the one that mentioned that we've been talking in stories for a long period of time. And, you know, it's interesting that uh, so much of the Bible, particularly the New Testament, is uh, parables. And that's what we remember is the parables. And so stories, narrative is something that I think is so critically important that we have to remember. But then I thought it was fascinating that Andrew talked about a lot of things that, that a lot of people wouldn't think about leaders. He talked about authenticity, authenticness. He talked about vulnerability. He talked about uh, listening. He talked about being human, um, inspiration, and listening. And, and that people want to be listened to. And so, you know, when we think about leadership, particularly when we think about leadership in a tough time that we're all going through, uh, don't just think about the general patent type of uh, example. Think about the, the, the person that gets people to join in with you. Because the one thing about leadership that stuck with me more than anything else is, uh, is, is again, my former boss, Jimmy Patterson said, Brian, the keys to leaders is they need followers. And some people want to be the big ass leader, but they're that in such a way that no one actually wants to join in and follow them. And if you don't have any followers, you're not a leader. And so you got to be the type of person that is going to attract some followers. And, uh, and I think that's key. You got to be the type of human being, as Elizabeth talked about it, that's going to attract followers. Anyway, that's our show for tonight. I'm coming to you every Monday through Friday at six o'clock on Saga 960 AM. Thanks for joining us. Good night.